Hi, Tom. Oh, how's everyone? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Uh, not bad. Beautiful day today. Getting all I, my fall work in. I was in council all day, so I looked nice <laughs> out my window. Yeah, well, sometimes there's advantages to being semi-retired. <laughs> Good evening. Hi. How are we doing? Hi. Good evening, Kelly. I assume I need more than six for quorum. My math is seven. Am I right? You're right. And Eileen's just joining us now. Oh, so yes. we have seven. Oh, and Mohammed's joining as well. Excellent. Ms. Duncan, hello. Good evening, everyone. Vice hello. Chair. You have quorum. All right. Do we do we have any regrets for anyone? I haven't received any regrets. Okay. Fair I don't see there. Councillor King, but I also didn't hear from him either. So. So which In board are we electing tonight, Scott? Yeah. Well, what I was going to actually say, we'll go through a series of questions, and whoever asks the. The best question will be appointed to the next available vacancy on council. Oh, that's great. Great process. <laughs> you don't get to pick which ward it is, though. Whatever happens, happens. Hmm. Today was so much better than a by-election. I mean, a by-election, I mean, how fair is that? People running and getting elected duly by the residents of the, the ward. I mean, where's the fun in democracy? Uh, <laughs> okay. Making jokes is hard on Zoom because you can't hear people laughing. I know. It's okay. Some of you just don't laugh at my jokes anyway, so it's, it feels better. Like there's less, in a public setting, the, the silence is, is, is awkward. Here, I, I don't feel as bad. So we have uh, Don Herwar and Court Courier here. Is anyone else uh, from staff joining us? Do you know Kelly? 
Uh, I, Don or Court might be better to answer that question. Yeah, I, th I think we had some internal confusion. I saw an email that I just replied back that suggested the meeting started at six. So I've, uh, I believe Lily is joining us and Richard Ash from Building Code Services. So um, yeah, hopefully they saw the email and the, the Okay. Well, we can start regardless and then um, whatever aspect of the presentation would be theirs, uh, they can <clears throat> they can do. So um, I'll call sorry, uh, Chair, I just received an email from Richard and I'm just sending him the, the Zoom details now. Okay, sounds good. So welcome to agenda seven of the Plan Advisory Committee. I'd like to call the meeting to order for Wednesday, November 10th. Um, so we'll do, uh, just do a quick uh, roll call. Uh, I can run through that. Uh, Shannon Bassett's. Here. Here. Aileen Duncan, here. Well, yeah, there she is. Oh, sorry. Uh, Farah Issa. I saw Farah. I think they got bumped out and they're there. Thank you. Sorry, it took me out of panelist mode. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cal Kirkpatrick is not here. Carolyn McKenzie is here. here. Tom Moss is here. David Renfro is here. And Claude Schellenberg is here. Brad Smith is not here. One of these days we'll have a meeting in person and Brad Smith will be able to attend. But he, as long as he lives in Birds Rapids, <laughs> we'll assume that he won't be able to attend a virtual meeting. Hey, Calker Patrick's here. And Coralia Tarasic is here. Excellent. Oh, and Mohammed. Albert Fai, sorry, I started at the bottom and I didn't look up and then I'm here as well. And Councillor King is not, but Councillor Gower is here. So Stitzville, Rita Rockliffe, it's about the same thing. Confirmation of minutes for our meeting of February 3rd, 2021. Are those meeting minutes carried? Mohammed, are you talking to me or are you talking to someone else? I'm on. If you're trying to talk to me, Mohammed, I can see your face moving, but I can't hear you. No, nothing. How about now? There you go, I hear you now. Okay. Just regarding the minutes, I did have a comment about the minutes, um, just more so the uh, extreme brevity. It felt like it didn't really capture, that was a pretty uh, in-depth conversation we had at the presentation for the um, official, uh, or the, sorry, the um, official plan uh, as we heard it uh, review. And it felt like uh, the actual uh, record of that meeting was extremely abbreviated and did not record most of what I thought was a really great discussion and with some pointers and some requests for follow-up and clarification. So I'm not sure where to go from here. Um, it's it's just, I would like to note that the, to me, those minutes do not capture the full extent of the conversation. Um, that well, I can, I can say that from this point forward, it won't be as difficult. So tonight we're recording this meeting and it's going to be posted on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So in the new year, we're gonna start live streaming um, advisory committee meetings. But for this meeting, we're going to uh, we're going to upload it to YouTube after the fact, so it will be there, uh, viewable for anyone afterwards. So just a reminder for those uh, on camera that it will be displayed on YouTube at a later date, and it just lives in perpetuity. Yeah. So I like guess if, it was it, it was a comment about action, uh, more action, like when 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 we're asking for follow up, and I think it's again it's not the first time that we've asked for follow up on some of our comments and and, um, and it's it's more of that that somehow there's a record of conversations and requests for uh, follow up that and the, you know the meeting minutes somehow record that uh, need to take action and there were no action items in those minutes. Okay I'll note that I don't think uh, Kelly I don't think it was you last time I think it was Eric so we can follow up I'm pretty sure it was Eric that was the community coordinator at the last uh, no, the last one was me. Um, okay. 
Um, that was the special meeting, but the February 3rd one, though. Yeah, no, it was me as well. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, and technically, um, as per the procedure bylaw, um, minutes are supposed to be action minutes. Um, I can I can go back and, and look if there's concern. I think it was the, the OP was the special meeting that um, Mohammed yeah, was referring to, right. which yeah. is July. Um, okay. So I can uh, yeah. take that away. And I know that a lot of, uh, or that, the recording of that meeting was circulated to a lot of people afterwards. Um, I can take that away and see if uh, we can actually upload that one as well. Okay. That's great. Okay, so on the minutes for February 3rd, 2021, we carry those. Okay. Carry, thank you. And then the special meeting minutes of July 15th, 2021, just obviously with the comments that Muhammad noted, carried. Thank you. So we have one item on the agenda today, and it is an item that assumes that nothing will happen between today and the end of the year. It is a year in review before the year is over. <coughs> so it's the Planning Infrastructure Economic Development 2021 year in review. And with us, we have uh, Don Herwire, Court Curry, Richard Ash. Who else did you tell me is going to be here? Oh, Lily Zhu, but she'll be here a little bit later. So who's starting? Is Don starting? Sure, Chair, I'll, I'll start. And uh, hopefully Lily can join us uh, and do her section at the end. If not, I'll uh, I'll go through her through her slides. So uh, Kelly, can you move to the EDLRP section? I'm thinking it's around slide eight or nine. Oh. Keep going. There we go. All right. So uh, it's good to be with everyone this evening. Uh, again, my name is Don Herwire. I'm the Director of Economic Development and Long Range Planning at the City. Um, just thought I'd spend a couple moments uh, covering the year that almost was in terms of 2021. We're, uh, we're uh, I guess, 10 months and a, and a bit through. Um, so obviously, the you know the biggest achievement, and it's probably dominated uh, PAC uh, agendas and planning committee and council over the last uh, few years is the uh, new official plan. And that was um, adopted by council uh, a couple of weeks back on October 27th. So uh, staff are currently busy uh, working through all the motions and, and changes that were made uh, at joint committee and council, packaging, patch, packaging those uh, uh, amendments up. And we'll be, um, it'll be a bylaw that goes to council uh, at the end of November, after which we will be sending it off to the, uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for uh, their review and hopefully approval. Um, so that, that's anticipated uh, probably in the spring of next year in terms of the, the time they have to, uh, to review. Uh, they, can, they can review sorry, they can approve as is, they can make modifications or they can send it back uh, to us uh, with, uh, you know, direction to start over. So um, I think it's probably going to be uh, an approval or approval with modifications, but uh, we shall see. Um, so in terms of other uh, projects that were completed or about to be completed in 2021, so we building on the official plan work, uh, we presented uh, new zoning bylaw work plan and budgets, uh, preliminary version in January. And then just uh, today, council approved the, uh, the work plan and budget that, uh, that will really build on the official plan and implement a lot of those changes uh, on the ground, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, another project that was completed uh, was the uh, Westboro uh, infill uh, zoning project that was completed in February of this year. Um, it would give you a fairly good sense of, of some of the zoning changes that will, will likely flow uh, from the official plan in, in certain neighborhoods. So uh, a very successful project. We resolved some, uh, some last uh, appeals on uh, our infill zoning changes in May of this year. Uh, on the rural front, we, uh, we had a, a new zoning uh, change uh, 
permit uh, approved that uh, allowed for more diversified uh, uses in our agricultural areas to uh, to support uh, agriculture, certainly continue to protect uh, our, our agricultural lands, but create some other opportunities, um, you know, for reasonable uses that uh, that would support uh, those agricultural operations. Uh, we building on our work with with bylaw. There were some zoning changes that implemented uh, the short term uh, rental bylaw in the spring of uh, 2021. That is currently under appeal, so we're waiting to uh, to sort that out. And then there were uh, some amendments that uh, are really setting the stage for the new uh, zoning bylaw. Call them quick hit amendments. Some some housekeeping, uh, getting some things in order. And uh, yeah, our group drafted 129 zoning bylaw amendments and dealt with six uh, legal non-conforming reviews. So that's uh, uses that uh, exist and predate the zoning bylaw that have those rights to continue. Next slide, please. Uh, another another project. It's uh, and, and this is uh, near and dear to Carolyn's heart. Is the uh, Bank Street Height Character Review? It's scheduled to come to uh, Planning Committee on November twenty fifth. So uh, we'll assume that will be in the completed column soon. Um, other secondary plans that were completed were the uh, Corso Italia Station District Secondary Plan, formerly referred to as the Gladstone Secondary Plan. Uh, we had a, a secondary plan for the East Urban Community uh, uh, that was approved in uh, earlier this year. And I did mention the Westboro uh, study uh, in Q1. Apologies if you can hear my cat meowing. Um, ongoing projects, uh, we have both building better, uh, smarter suburbs and building better infill. And those are multiple projects uh, that, that cross multiple service areas that are ongoing. Uh, and, and will continue um, uh, in the coming years as well. Next slide. Some uh, pro projects that are uh, in progress that are not complete, uh, Pine, Pinecrest Queensview Station, um, uh, Riverside South, um, Lincoln Fields Secondary Plan, the Orleans um, uh, uh, LRT Corridor uh, Station Plan, um, there, there, two of those will finish in 2022, and the uh, the others will be 2023. And we're also uh, starting a, a collaboration with uh, uh, the federal government on the Confederation Heights Master Plan, and that's uh, that's just getting underway with the targeted completion for 2024. Next slide. Uh, some some other projects um, that are that are underway is the inclusionary zoning piece that uh, that will build off the uh, the policies that were established in the framework in the official plan, and those are those are tied to you know affordable housing in um, uh, transit station areas as per uh, the the planning act. We have an interim control by along the along the Woodruff corridor to uh, to protect for land um, for that extension of stage two, and that will be uh, wrapping up in uh, Q two of next year. Uh, currently, we're we're dealing with some uh, changes to our commercial outdoor patios, building on some of our experience and uh, we think successes uh, during during the uh, the pandemic in in terms of loosening up some of those permissions. So that will be coming to committee, uh, I believe in December. And then there's, again, some various uh, zoning pieces that, um, that are ongoing or uh, about to, uh, to hit committee. Um, yeah, next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Mr. Curry and he'll walk you through the uh, public realm and urban design piece. Great, thanks, Don. Uh, nice to see a lot of familiar faces uh, on the call tonight. And uh, for those of you that I haven't met before, my name is Court Curry. I'm the manager of Right Away Heritage and Urban Design at the, the city. So uh, as Don said, uh, on behalf of the department, thank you so much for uh, coming out tonight and listening to us. And certainly, uh, we're going to be uh, giving you a lot of information on, on what is being proposed for the remainder of the year and what we've accomplished. And Certainly welcome your questions uh, at the end of, uh, end of the deck. So I'm gonna start with the Public Realm and Urban Design Group, which is part of my team made up of landscape architects, architects, planners focused on uh, designing great public spaces and on providing uh, design uh, assistance to our development review program. 
Um, in terms of ongoing projects this year, uh, we've been working quite closely with Don's group as part of the COVID economic recovery on public realm um, tactical urbanism projects. So you've likely seen the road closures in the Glee, the Byward Market, uh, various parts of Centre Town, supporting the restaurant and retail sector, <laughs> looking at what uh, we can do in terms of creating temporary pop-up spaces and additional pedestrian spaces to support our, uh, our traditional main street. We've also uh, been reviewing our urban design review panel management. So those of you that have been at the panel before, or know of the panel, we've had the, uh, the uh, panel made up of architects and landscape architects from across Ontario that look at some of our more um, higher profile development. It's been in existence now for 15 years. And obviously with the enhanced importance on urban design placed by a new official plan, we're looking at what comes to our panel and how we provide uh, um, development, ongoing development support through uh, through the panel operations. We've got the busiest urban design panel in the country. We just did a scan across uh, Canada. We've got the most number of applications and the most number of sittings of any panel in Canada, which we're very proud of. Um, and we're looking at, as we move forward, um, how we can refine our criteria to make sure that the most important ones are going there. And in general, how we can infuse that design culture throughout, uh, throughout the department. Part of that is through the development of urban design guidelines. Um, some of you will be familiar with the high-rise design guidelines that were completed two years ago. Again, our new official plan places a lot of emphasis on low-rise housing and ground-oriented development. So our next design guideline up is the low-rise design guideline, um, which will be before council by, uh, the, uh, by next June. The team is busy working on that right now, and there'll be industry and community engagement on that. We're working as well on the development of new maintenance quality standards for specialty spaces and streets. What the heck is that? That sounds like a bunch of government gobbledygook. Uh, it is basically our standards that our public works colleagues use to maintain our, our main streets. So think about uh, Manitick Main Street or West uh, Richmond uh, Road in, in, um, in Westboro or the Byward Market are, are high priority areas for economic development and uh, what are the, the streets in the areas that are essentially the, the hearts of our, uh, of our neighborhoods. So we're working with that team on an elevated standard for maintenance, graffiti removal, street sweeping, replacement of pavers, maintenance of trees, landscaping, et cetera, to really uh, denote that there are streets and places in Ottawa that deserve a higher level of maintenance and upkeep. Uh, they align to our development objectives, to our economic development objectives, and uh, it of course all comes with a with a price tag. Working on that strategy to put before council uh, in the spring. The final uh, piece on here is the land management system implementation. So when Lily joins us, she'll likely be speaking further about it but it's a $25 million um, IT investment once in a generation that is essentially um, going to allow us to, to, to take in all planning applications and circulation electronically, also engage differently with the community. And really it's the backbone of how our, our department works in terms of doing business. And we're excited to, to look at its opportunities to, uh, to be more transparent and to disseminate information more readily to those uh, interested in in that type of information. Next slide. In terms of projects initiated this year, we were lucky to receive a, a significant amount of federal infrastructure funding for the public realm. Obviously, we've never appreciated it more in our lifetimes in the last 18 months. Um, so the federal government was generous enough to give us some funding to undertake a suite of tactical programs. One of which is taking Ottawa into the big city leagues. So those of you that have traveled around uh, North America or the world really have seen how sophisticated cities have uh, sophisticated wayfinding uh, signage in their, in their cores, um, demonstrating where amenities such as public washrooms, tourism destinations, uh, tra public transit. Um, so we've, we've uh, un undertaken a first tranche of investment here through federal government funding to roll out uh, a suite of these signs and kiosks through the Byward Market. They'll be installed later next year. Um, there's a, our first one right outside the Rideau Station on William Street. And it's really, uh, we're working with a company out of London, England um, and Toronto on, uh, on 
implementing a really sophisticated way that, that pairs up with our transit wayfinding. We're also building Ottawa's two uh, first publicly owned standalone public washrooms, obviously with social equity being top of mind more than ever before. Um, the Gotta Go campaign folks and a number of advocacy groups have done a lot of good work and have rallied uh, us to make the business case to build two standalone washrooms in two of our economic tourist centers being Spark Street and Byron Market, working on the design and implementation of those. And finally, um, the Byron Market Sussex No Traffic Study. What the heck is that? That is um, a traffic study, which is the first step at uh, reinvigorating and reimagining the space right in front of the temporary Senate at the intersection of, of Sussex and Rideau, um, where there's that flyover. Um, looking at National Capital Commission plans, city plans call for a reconfiguration and a pedestrianization uh, of that space. And the traffic study is the first step in terms of building the business case to dismantle uh, the traffic flyover that was built in the 50s and really create a new ceremonial gateway um, to both uh, Confederation Boulevard, but also uh, the Byward Market Lower Town Precinct, right at the footstep of the major investments that's been made by Cadillac Fairview and others in the, in the market in the last few years. And then finally, we've got our, our uh, 2021 uh, Urban Design Awards. Uh, they're put on every two years, um, very important in terms of calling out and recognizing uh, great urban design that is being uh, undertaken in our, in our community. Also, these uh, these uh, successful awards recipients go forward to the REIC awards. Fortunately, they, they will be online this year, but uh, they will be released, uh, the award winners will be released uh, at the end of this month. Next slide. So over to heritage planning, a group made up of heritage planners that you'd be familiar with um, in terms of those of you that have come out to build heritage subcommittee or that do business with, uh, with the department. I'll go through the year in review there. Next slide, please. So currently uh, continuing the review of our Centertown Heritage Conservation Plan. Uh, it's one of our oldest existing uh, plans and our biggest heritage conservation district. So it was put in place in 1997 by the former city of Ottawa. This has been a two year project engaging the community and the industry and will be coming forward to build heritage subcommittee planning committee and city council at the beginning of 2022 with a new updated plan. Center town, obviously, we're seeing a significant amount of development interest, and so this plan is you know, on a priority basis for completion. We've also had a significant uh, change of, of legal terrain in Ontario with respect to heritage with the implementation of Bill 108, the most sweeping changes to the Ontario Heritage Act since uh, 2005 really a, a new onus on the city in terms of notification to, uh, to the public and to landowners of, of heritage implications on their property and much more due diligence on the city to identify earlier in the development review process where there's a heritage interest. So we're in the midst of uh, implementing all of those mandatory changes to our, to our program right now. And I'm happy to talk about that further if there's those interested in uh, discussing further. Next slide, Kelly. So finally, in terms of, of uh, uh, projects initiated this year, uh, following up on the footsteps of Centertown, we're undertaking the Byward Market and Lower Town West Heritage Conservation District update to very important parts of town, not seeing a lot of development, uh, but certainly um, these are older plans that are, that are not in conformity with modern um, heritage legis legislation, and we want to pair up with our Byward Market public realm plan. So that's just getting underway uh, later this month. Updating our cultural heritage impact statement uh, in terms of reference. So those of you that have clients or or know what these are, there are, are exactly what the, the title says are um, our studies that provide impacts of development um, through the lens of the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, updating our requirements in alignment with the new official plan and new legislation uh, next year. A neat project in Councillor Brockington's board is the, uh, the heritage study of the Carlton, Carlington North veterans community. So those of you familiar with that community right across the street from the, the old Westgate Mall um, has really interesting heritage uh, merits to it in terms of uh, not necessarily the housing, you know, all the small little box uh, post-war houses that were built for our vets, 
but more the layout of the streets and the setbacks. So not sure it's a district, but we're engaging with the community right now on looking at what form of heritage protection should be put on that uh, very special uh, and unique community in Ottawa. And then finally, uh, similar to development review, we've implemented a, an opportunity for community associations to undertake, uh, to have a seat at the table rather at our pre-consultation applications uh, for, for our heritage applications. Worked out quite successfully in terms of bringing folks from the community into the tent earlier in the development review process. We've done an evaluation and we're now making that permanent as of last month for all neighborhoods in Ottawa. Uh, for all heritage applications that come up to committee. So I whiz through that fast. Again, uh, as I said earlier, happy to take any questions or provide any clarity at the end. I think it is now over to Mr. Buchanan. Or sorry, Mr. Ash. Ron Richard. Yeah, maybe me. Thank you, uh, Court. And uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming out. And uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Ash. I'm the manager of permit approvals for building code services. Next slide, please. So this is the one and only slide that we have. We don't have the numerous slides of the other groups, but uh, I don't want that to uh, make you think that we're uh, we're not that we're sitting on our hands in building code services. Uh, just to maybe a quick little tweet out to, to everyone if they hadn't already heard, the mayor had uh, kindly put out a tweet out that we hit ten thousand building permits back in October. Um, and we're over 10,500 now and probably going to top out over 11,000. So uh, as a heavily operational group, we're very proud of the fact that we've managed to keep, uh, keep ourselves together through COVID and, uh, and uh, managed to put out that, that number of permits. Who knew we would get a building boom through, uh, through uh, something like this? But uh, on top of that, we are doing a number of reviews of bylaws. Uh, the building bylaw uh, started uh, this year and is, is an ongoing review and uh, is slated to be completed in Q2 of 2022. Uh, the pool enclosure bylaw is also under review and will be completed at the same time. And the addressing bylaw is also uh, under review and uh, is slated for completion in Q2. Um, it was hoped uh, these were going to be completed in 2021, but have been uh, pushed a little bit due to, uh, due to other priorities. Um, and then, of course, the annual report uh, pursuant to the Building Code Act uh, is uh, dealt with on an annual basis, and that, that'll be going to uh, committee, uh, committee and Council uh, at a later date. Uh, and some other ongoing pros, uh, projects uh, Court had spoken briefly about the land management system. Uh, Building Code Services is the uh, first, first go live uh, in a long uh, stream of uh, other groups that are, will be taking that on. It, it's the backbone architecture GIS uh, system that uh, we currently use now under another system, but uh, it's end of life and we'll be moving forward with this new system. We have a vendor uh, on site and uh, configuration is ongoing. Uh, we will have uh, early in 2022, we'll have our release one. A building code services is breaking it down into a couple of go lives. Uh, first one being uh, early uh, spring of 2022 with uh, go live two in the uh, in Q4. And uh, you know this will sort of give us a, a more of a digital, overall digital process uh, for implementation of permits, uh, issuance, everything will be done. Uh, and there'll be, a, there'll be a portal in order to apply and uh, pay online. So it's a very transformative uh, with regards to the processes that we have today and, and should be, uh, I think it's been a long time coming and I think something that'll be well received uh, by, uh, by industry. Uh, being able to uh, not as, not that we don't want to see you at our counters, but we'll obviously uh, see maybe a little bit less of you as you uh, as you apply and and deal online with the new system. So that's what we have, and um, that is the end of the presentation. All right, thanks. So let's go back to the start so that Lily can jump in. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, I think I'll. 
for those of you who don't know, uh, Lily is our acting director of planning services. Uh, Leanne Sneddon has retired, and uh, but Lily has not been at this uh, at this committee before, so that's what her role is now. Thank you, Chair, for the introduction, and I'll skip the, the first uh, slide now. Thank you. Next slide, please. Next. Thank you. Um, so, Chair and uh, members of the committee, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to provide you the year in review uh, for planning services. 2021 uh, is a challenging year. Uh, one of the challenges that we're facing with the work volume. After a gentle cooling down in 2020, uh, the land and development industry picked up a very high speed in 2021 resulting on um, over 20% increase in application volume comparing to last year for, uh, for the same period as shown here. Uh, the graphics here are uh, based on the data by the end of September. We have just received information for October. The application volume in October is a historical record for any month in the past the five years and probably 10 or 20 years as well. Uh, there, were 20, there were 81 applications received in a single month of uh, October. It is also noticeable that the number of pre-application consultations that we have held in 2021 hits a new record as well. Uh, this is a strong indicator of the application volume in the next two years uh, because typically a pre-application consultation materializes into actual development applications in one or two years. And also shown here is the general trend of application volumes uh, in different areas. The central, rural, and the west areas are experiencing a noticeable increase, while the south and the east areas appear to be generally consistent comparing to last year. Next slide, please. Um, planning services, uh, our staff takes uh, great pride in our work. Uh, the development application review process is a value adding process through uh, collaboration. So I'd like to highlight a few examples uh, from this year here. The first image uh, on the left is the addition to the Chateau Laurier Hotel. Uh, our team worked closely with heritage and urban design teams during the review of the site plan control application. This is the application that we have received the greatest number of public comments. I think the number was around 1,300 comments or, or more than that. The second image is for the development of two Robinson Avenue. It is a mixed use uh, with over 1,400 units. Uh, through the review of official plan amendment, uh, zoning bylaw amendment, and the site plan control applications, staff worked closely with the community and the counselor's office to ensure a public park, uh, community spaces, as well as affordable housing are provided, even though section 37 does not apply uh, to this application. The third image uh, is a hearing gate redevelopment of over 6,000 units. This area had a very unique demographic context. During the review of the application, eight public information sessions were held. Uh, key documents were provided in five different languages. Even though there wasn't an effective regulatory tool to demand affordable units, planning services staff were able to negotiate for over 1,000 units at different affordable levels. The last image here shows part of the future Ottawa Hospital. The master site plan was recently approved by council. The complexity of the application was due to the regional impacts of the development, the multiple layers of governments and agencies uh, that are involved, and multiple timelines and mandates that this project must satisfy. And the next phases I plan are still uh, ongoing. Next slide, please. So in addition to development applications, uh, we also carried on a number of special projects in 2021. The land management system, uh, which were mentioned several times already, will fundamentally change how planning services does business. We have identified the two full-time staff as dedicated resources to work on business requirements to help us prepare for release two in 2023. Also, as a result of the uh, new official plan, 
our staff are not reviewing application according uh, to both the new plan and the old plan policies. It is a significant amount of policy change and it will be reflected in application reports going forward as per the transition policy in the new OP. Um, planning services and the legal services also worked together to improve uh, process, address agreement uh, timelines. Uh, we are monitoring the uh, agreement timelines now and the impacts of the process change. For the user fees review, we're looking at 2023 and the 2024 implementation. The new land management system will help us track uh, staff's time better to com complete a full cost accounting uh, exercise. This will also allow fees to reflect the time actually spent on applications and help matching workforce needs with applications coming in. And also the Brownfield a Community Improvement Plan is due for an update. And the new plan is currently being worked on and will join other CIP programs to seek council approval in 2023. In responding to the pandemics, uh, we implemented many improvements to support electronic processes and will be maintaining most of them moving forward. These processes have uh, resulted in reduced work for staff as well as simplified process for applicants. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of projects initiated this year, a series of backlog reduction strategies were worked on, including hiring a temporary employees, encouraging the usage of letter of undertaking instead of agreements, as well as supporting conditional permits for site plans. We also worked on improvements to site plan conditions. Uh, the goal is to ensure consistency with legal services to support a shortened agreement uh, timeline. And finally, is a pilot project of the Community Planning Permit System for Canada North Tech Park. I saw Chair Gar just forwarded the link uh, from CBC's coverage uh, this is for this site, uh, for this project as well. It is an exercise to develop a new type of process with intent uh, to make approval more streamlined, to support the local priorities and to create a predictability for the community. This project will take several years to finish. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, looking forward, we are very excited about 2022 with the full implementation of the new OP and a number of exciting development applications to progress forward, uh, including the Salvation Army site plan, the Manor Park area specific plan and the Tailwind sector plan and the community design plan that has been worked on um, jointly by planning services and Don Hawar's uh, team. We will also provide a training to staff on new policies, tools and the procedures and the remaining our effort on continuous process improvement. Thank you, that's all I have. All right, uh, thank you, Lily, uh, Don, Court and Richard. I know that was a lot to take in. I think the presentation had been shared uh, with you uh, earlier today. Uh, so if we had a chance to, to have a look and if you have any questions for staff, uh, now would be the time. All right, we'll start with uh, Anne Cloak. Uh, thanks everyone for your presentations. Can you hear me? Yep. Wonderful. Uh, this question I think overlaps uh, several of the presentations tonight. Uh, in terms of some of the uh, urban infill projects and the goals for the creation of public space, uh, are you looking at strategies uh, to improve uh, POPs, so privately owned public spaces, as well as maybe vertical integration of uh, city parks and privately owned, uh, say, underground parking? Uh, just wondering about some of the thinking on that. Next question is the question that I think all of us would have uh, something to layer on to. Uh, maybe I'll just start and then I'll kick it over to, to Don and Lily for sure. Um, with respect to POPs, yes. And you know what, I didn't have that in my presentation, but we actually are developing uh, 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 POPs guidelines uh, for Ottawa uh, that we've brought forward uh, next year, hopefully before uh, the end of the term of council. Um, 
we've been relatively unsuccessful in securing um, pops in our in our developments up until about maybe two years. And Lily could probably elaborate more on that. But we've started to work together between our two groups, our public realm group and our development review group, and trying to achieve these, particularly in our urban area where we know we've got uh, a deficiency of, uh, of public space as part of our official plan, uh, a public uh, realm or parks master plan just came forward that identified throughout Ottawa in a geographic uh, uh, area um, where we were deficient. Probably many of you participated in that process or aware of what I'm talking about. So we're leveraging uh, uh, that plan with our development review process with the guidelines that were under development to examine where we can seek these out. Don and Lily, I don't know whether you want to layer on anything more onto that from your perspectives. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, the, that's the critical points. Of course, certainly the uh, there are policies in the uh, the OP that uh, speak to the importance of pops, especially in some of our, uh, you know, in the downtown areas, for instance. Uh, it's going to be difficult to get uh, acquire land for larger parks. So I think they they form. Uh, uh, a key part of our strategy to, you know, make our uh, our intensifying areas uh, uh, more levelable. It was a big thing we heard uh, through the OP, and uh, how that contributes to, you know, the creation of 15-minute neighborhoods and so on. So, uh, agree, highly important, and uh, certainly there have been some successes. I think there is is room for improvement, and I'll leave it to Lily if she has anything to add. <laughs> Um, thank you, Don Court. Uh, something to add is the, uh, in addition to, there are a few examples that are, we're, we're able to achieve, uh, uh, you know, certain level of the pop um, with uh, works and collaboration from uh, courts and the uh, Dunhorst shop. And also the, another player is the, our parks and the recreation uh, planning team uh, in terms of their overall um, concept the vision of uh, green space uh, recreational space provided for either an, a community area or the city wide as well all right thank you and clubs any other questions or um i do but i'll leave it to others <laughs> for now. just before i get to the next question um i i have an inkling that most of the stuff we're going to talk about tonight are going to be planning related does anyone, just by a show of actual hand, have a question related to building code services or building permits? Oh, you guys do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Richard, I was trying to see if I could let you go, but <laughs> you're shit out of luck. Um, okay. So we'll go on to Aileen Duncan. Thanks so much for your presentations tonight, everyone. Uh, I actually had just a couple comments for uh, Mr. Curry. So the first section I wanted to comment on was about the maintenance standards. I think it's important that you're revising those. And I wanted to draw your attention to two items, uh, one being uh, urban trees. Uh, so you may know urban trees are often injured by maintenance vehicles. So I encourage you to um, ensure there's a good buffer zone around the physical trunk of the tree, but also keep in mind the root systems, which expand at least as far as the drip line uh, of the canopy. So keep that in mind. The second section, um, you mentioned graffiti removal. My personal opinion, uh, sophisticated cities have a good graffiti management strategy that involves um, appreciating the creativity that goes into some of the street art. So I encourage you to bring a more discerning eye into which pieces are left for removal or are encouraged to be removed and which are left so perhaps uh, a little bit more leniency as to what kind of public art is left in the in the public space. Um, in terms of the cultural heritage impact statement, um, more from a reconciliation based view, uh, culture and land are inextricable. They're they're very related, and so I encourage you to ensure there's some connectivity between uh, preserving ecosystems and important land bases. Uh, is as part of that strategy. Thanks so much. Can I butt in with one correction on root spread and tree canopy? Not necessarily related. All right. Was there any question there, Eileen, or just, just it was just a comment? Okay, perfect. 
Uh, well, not perfect, but you know what I mean. Uh, we'll move on to Shannon Bassett. Hi, thank you for all of your presentations. Um, I had a question for Court. Um, I, I just, it's a two part question. And you had mentioned that you had, I guess the city had received sizable funding from it for infrastructure. And I was just wondering who was that from? Was that from Infrastructure Canada? Um, actually, maybe I'll, I'll pause on that question and get the answer <laughs> before moving forward. If you could just kind of elaborate on who, who the funding was for, for, for infrastructure. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to forget the name of the exact funding stream, but I think it's called the COVID Economic Recovery Resiliency Stream. It was federal government funding uh, channeled through the province uh, for tactical public realm projects. So funding the wayfinding signs, funding the two washrooms. FedDev Ontario has al also released back in the late summer a similar stream uh, for, for public realm improvements. The city put forward about $15 million of, of projects uh, throughout Ottawa um, um, to improve public realm streetscapes and villages, towns, suburban town centers and urban cores. And we have not heard back yet on that one, although we're an ongoing dialogue, so we're hopeful. Was it the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, ISIP? Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. That was actually the first one. You're right. That was the name. It was ISIP was the first one. And the second one, uh, I may have them reversed, maybe the Canadian Resiliency Fund. I'm happy to provide some clarity afterwards to the committee members. I apologize for jumbling the names. Um, yeah, uh, th thank you. I, I guess that leads to my question in terms of um, kind of improvements in the urban realm. I, you talked about signage, I think street furniture and wayfinding. Um, and I was, I was hoping to hear that there was also kind of green infrastructure within that. And so I think, again, my, I know that there's been a significant amount of funding released from Infrastructure Canada, specifically for green infrastructure. Um, and it's, it's been a question I've been asking at several of these meetings, um, even with respect to like the official plan. I know that it's a goal to integrate more performative kind of ecological or green infrastructure into the city. But to kind of understand, you know, is that being done, or in fact, what are the uh, more of the opportunities to do it? Um, you know, on view of again, I just use the example in my my own neighborhood, but Central Park in the Glebe, it experiences seasonal flooding. It was born, it was built in a floodplain or a wetland, but it just seems like there continues to be kind of a heavy-handed gray infrastructure approach. Whereas I think that. We can look to best case practices in even, you know, Scandinavian winter cities who are engaging, uh, you know, green infrastructure as part of their public realm, but that are also places, um, so they're performative for stormwater management it's in ecological services, but also offering, you know, places for social gatherings, right, or um, and so maybe the last part of that comment is, it, I mean, I know there's been specific pilot projects, I think, on Sunnyside Ave in Ottawa South, but, you know, maybe we could continue to kind of develop from these pilot projects and incentivize, um, you know, implementation or again, loose it like as we've done with the pop ups, like in public spaces, loosen up the zoning to allow people to further or developers to implement that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shannon. Uh, Carolyn McKenzie. Great, thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for all the presentations. Um, I uh, I guess I don't know when the, the next uh, PAC um, uh, committee meeting is going to be. Maybe I, I know February last 2nd. year. February, oh, February 2nd. second. Okay, so we'll be talking. So I, I won't ask questions about the work plan so much uh, for next year because um, yeah, I will be on that work plan will be on that agenda. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'll try and I'll, I'll try and narrow my questions a little bit. Um, but I did have a few questions about some of the, the uh, work streams, and I think probably these could fall under your um, purview, Don. Um, so I'm wondering, you mentioned the Quick Hits report, um, and I think I saw that it was completed in June of this year. Is that, have I got that right? Yeah, that's correct. It uh, dealt largely with the sort of administrative parts of the bylaw. Um, collapse uh, collapse some uh, subzones together definitions that kind of thing it was it's kind of a I'd characterize it as some housekeeping but I could send you a link to that if you're interested okay yeah so my my next question was I was wondering when it was going to be uh, made public 
uh, and what the plan was for public engagement. Now, if it's very, it's if it's mostly technical and nothing substantive, nothing that anyone would need to um, pay attention to, <laughs> or or uh, be you know uh, to think about. Um, but uh, it, it was just, it was mentioned. I, I thought the description indicated something a little bit more substantive earlier. But if it's if that's not the case, then then that's uh, that's fine. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it was exactly that very technical nature. I think perhaps the, um, you know, we're, we're going to bring forward a, a building on the OP uh, um, language, a, a big moves report on on the zoning in, in 2022, early 2022. So uh, I think that's probably more uh, of what you're interested in, inter would be interested in, in terms of those uh, sort of key directions building on the OP. And that's, uh, I believe that's Q2. 22. So that, that could be yeah. a topic for uh, our yeah. next meeting as well. Okay. Um, so, so the big moves report now, I think that originally had a, um, uh, had a, a timeline or, or a, a scheduled date of arrival uh, in Q3 2021, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm wondering what the delay um, is, what, what, uh, what's the source of the delay and should we be concerned about that, I guess? Yeah, no, that that's really a function of the uh, the delay in the official plan. The official plan was pushed back, so it it was felt as it wasn't reasonable to you know bring forward the the zoning um, big moves until the OP was in place. So it's strictly a function of the uh, extra time that was added to the official plan process to allow for that extra engagement, the, just the digesting the uh, you know the huge volume of information. So. It, it was strictly a function of uh, pushing the OP back that it, it thereby uh, pushed the uh, the zoning report back. Okay. Was it at the end of the day? Was the OP delayed by more than a month, or maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, not recalling it correctly? It just seemed like this is about a, a quarter quarter delay, and whereas the OP was, um, I know I realize it was delayed, but uh, I just yeah, yeah. Scott. I think Scott could correct me. I think it was it was more something in the line of a six week delay. I'd have to I'd have to pull it. It seems like a long time ago now, but uh, and and then we we do need also you know minister minister uh, ministry approval. Yes, know, of course. Plan to uh, yeah yeah okay, um, and then there were two other uh, pieces that that were mentioned, but I don't see them in the twenty in in what the presentations that were discussed tonight, which. And those were, um, there were theme discussion or approach papers. Uh, and those I think were meant to have landed in Q2, 2021, um, as for I think what council approved back in January. Um, and also the comparative review, although I think it may have been referred to as a best practice um, report in your presentation tonight. So just a little bit of different nomenclature there. Um, and that was meant to be Q3 20, 2021, respectively. So both of those were meant to land on or before the official plan. And, and I'm just wondering what's happening with those um, and, and what the plan is for public engagement on those. Yes, yeah, so, so we have, uh, we did require, uh, uh, retain a consultant that, that did that best uh, practice review uh, for us. We're just digesting that report now. So I think that will that will be released um, uh, at some point. I'll, I'll check with Mr. Wise on, on timing. It will, uh, I think it will be part of uh, and inform the, uh, the big moves uh, um, uh, report, but uh, I can get back to you on a more specific uh, time frame for that. Right, okay. Um... And I guess, and I guess, one other piece that I wanted to mention, and uh, <laughs> I, at the risk of uh, uh, again, sort of sound, sounding off on the same issue with um, the modeling uh, report, the implementation modeling report um, that uh, I and others had been had been asking for, and it was released in July. There's no mention of it here, um, and I'm wondering, other than releasing it and putting it up on the website. Um, I just wanted, I guess, to note that I don't believe there was anything other than the post to the, the Engagement Ottawa website. I don't believe there was any um, any other public consultation or um, discussion of of that uh, in terms of public uh, any public engagement. That is, um, and I think that's a. I, I think that to me anyway, that should have 
um, seen a bit more light of day and had a bit more engagement. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, Jared, it was uh, it was on Engage Ottawa. We did have, uh, I would say, uh, some feedback on it. Uh, we are bringing forward a, a separate report uh, on the monitoring piece, uh, given you know how big a, a theme and uh, uh, concern it was in the official plan. So nice. in early in 2022, there will be a, a full report on. Uh, on monitoring, uh, enhanced monitoring, additional resources for all the, you know, um, I, I would say monitoring was one of the, you know, one of the, the top 10 themes we probably heard in the OP is, you know, we need to do a, a more fulsome job and, and uh, you know, in terms of our monitoring approach. And Right, is there a just going forward with the, as we think about the, um, the comprehensive zoning bylaw review exercise, is there an intent to uh, continue to, to use and um, a modeling approach to understand the implications of different zoning options uh, in, in terms of our ability to reach our intensification goals. Will that will there be part and uh, yes, parcel yes, and, so. and I guess transparent as well? Yeah, no, I think that that's going to be a, a, a critical piece in terms of, uh, you know, the engagement that's going to happen, you know, on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. You know, there are, uh, we do need to achieve certain density tar targets. There's different ways to do it. Um, we saw like a, a, a version of it. Is that me or Don? Sorry. I was sorry. I freezing was, up? Yeah, you froze there for a bit there. Oh, maybe I'll, uh, I'm, I'm getting an unstable, unstable internet connection. So I'll turn off my video for a sec. Yeah, no apologies. Uh, you know, that, that sort of a, that modeling approach is going to be a big part of our, our consultation and community engagement on the new zoning bylaw in terms of, you know, those, those choices and, and where, you know, those, uh, that higher uh, amount of intensification is going to happen. So very much so. Okay. Um, I think that's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to others. I don't want to um, take just one uh, request. Uh, Scott, you mentioned, uh, Chair, you mentioned that um, we did get this slide deck uh, this afternoon, but it's just a few hours ago. I, I didn't have time to look at it before the meeting. Um, I don't know if there's any reason why it can't be sent out even just a few days in advance so that we can have a look at it and um, be a little better informed. Um, I mean, it's great to hear the presentations, but it would, for me anyway, it would be really helpful to get that um, even 48 hours in advance. Yeah, I spoke to Kelly about that last week about trying to get stuff out as quickly as it was available. I, I'm not yeah. certain, to be honest, if the, if the presentation was available before today, because um, I got it, I got it today for the first time too. So yeah, you know, ideally, we've talked about this before, we want staff getting stuff ready as uh, uh, as early as possible so it can be shared uh, sooner than the day of. So just kind of taking that away again. Uh, Great. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll let others uh, get in there. Thanks. Of course. Thanks, Carolyn. And you don't have to call me share. Um, Tom Moss. <laughs> Likewise, I like to thank staff for their presentation. And I'm, you know, I find myself at a disadvantage to some extent because I can't comment on all the projects that are, have been done and are underway because I, I just don't have the background, nor do I have, have I seen any of those projects delineate in such a way that I can comment on them. So I, I would note, though, that I'm sure that uh, the efforts to uh, put online the land management system must have been uh, you know, challenging at best, but I'm sure that the folks that are going to be using it going forward are going to benefit from it. My question is more for Don, for Dan. I, I didn't hear, and this is going into 2022, I didn't hear from him, and I'm hoping that there is a consolidated economic plan to, uh, to incentivize the small businesses post COVID. I'm wondering if the city has made any, any comments or has declared any package of this nature. Uh, can you, is there a willingness to, do, to go forward with you know, some sort of an incentive package? I, I note that in other communities and other areas in the provinces, I'm, that such a package has been delineated and discussed, but I haven't seen anything nor have I heard for the Ottawa area. So would someone comment on that? Uh, sorry, 
I don't know if it was your internet or, or mine, but I only heard part of uh, what you said there. So I don't ask know about any, uh, any incentives uh, for small businesses coming out of COVID. I, I will just say we did just approve a small business property tax subclass uh, at council recently, which will see a reduction in taxes for uh, small businesses. Uh, I can share that uh, with you, Tom, if you'd like to, to, to have a look at it. Is there anything else that coming down the road? Um, that's what I'm not sure. It actually might be a better a better question for finance, but I'm not sure from okay. economic development perspective, yeah. uh, Don, if there is anything on the small business, small businesses in terms of um, uh, you know COVID relief for future years. Yeah, <clears throat> so certainly the small business tax relief is uh, is you know fresh off council, and that's uh, you know been very well received. Uh, we are providing a lot of other supports in terms of, uh, you know, our work and uh, the Board of Trade in terms of helping, you know, uh, businesses adjust, um, you know, the Digital Main Street uh, program. There's, there's a variety of init initiatives. Uh, we do work closely with the business improvement areas, uh, the mm -hmm. Business Association's Board of Trade. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, a financial impact, I would say the, uh, the, the tax relief that just, uh, was approved by council would be the, uh, uh, the top, top item. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. I'll, I'll find that and I'll send, I can just share it with all the members of the committee just so that you all have exactly what I'm sending, Tom, just for reference, uh, David Renfro. Thank you, chair. I appreciate it. I know you don't want to be called chair, but. Richard, first off, I want to apologize. I, I actually don't have a question for you. I just have some um, some thank yous and some comments I wanted to pass on from uh, the Greater Ottawa Home Builders. So, um, you know, I just I think you all know I'm the president of the Greater Ottawa Home Builders, and and we are in a housing affordability crisis. There's there's no one federally, provincially, or locally that's denying that we aren't in a housing affordability crisis. And there's been uh, dozens of land economic uh, 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 economic specialists in the last six months to 12 months that have said the only way we're going to get out of this uh, housing affordability crisis and to solve the housing demand is to supply more land. We need to, we need to build more homes. We need to supply more hand, more uh, houses for residents or, or the crisis is going to get worse. So uh, locally um, what we need to do is to work with all the politicians. We need to work with all the community groups. And uh, of course we want, we need to work with staff um, so I just want to say on behalf of Goba, I think I think the record amount of applications that you know Richard and and Cor and, and Lily were just talking about about that's a direct link to housing demand, and uh, I just want to say on, on behalf of Goba, I want to thank Richard for everything you've done in building code services to to process this record amount of applications. You know, Lily, congratulations! You, you and I have worked together for many years now and um you know and, and i look forward to working with you on, on future applications manor park and many others and uh thank you to you and your team for for the record amount of applications that you have all processed in court same thing you and i have talked on many occasions and, and uh thanks for everything you're doing with the right away and with the permits uh the heritage permits and the urban design review panel so please on behalf of goba please thank your team um uh, we need we need your help to continue to grow the city and to provide housing supply. And, um, and lastly, I do have a question, so I apologize for taking everyone's time tonight, but uh, lastly, Don, um, you know, I know, uh, I know, I know I've said to you and Jason and others have said to you, um, you know, I, I guess first off is congratulations to, to you and your team and, and thank you. Um, I know uh, Goba didn't always agree on everything that uh, in the official plan and, um, but at the end of the day, what an amazing milestone for you and your team and for the city of Ottawa. And uh, I, I know everyone was giving you kudos at, at, uh, at, uh, at council and, and through uh, all the delegations, but uh, I think as, as a resident and a, and a, a taxpayer, uh, thank you. Thank you for the direction you're taking us in the city. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing this implemented in the years to come. So um, thank you for letting me say all that. I just, I have uh, one quick question. I have one suggestion. Uh, my question is for you, Don. And uh, just, just around the whole land supply lens that, that we're having issues with, um, we know the official plans going to get, the bylaw will be passed at council. It's going to go to the province. Um, 
hopefully 120 days, and then uh, we'll get through the, the appeal process at the provincial level. W when can expansion lands begin the terms of reference process? We, we, need, we desperately need more land supply, and uh, we know a secondary plan process needs a terms of reference to move forward. Um, when can we expect that? Are you waiting until the province has adopted the OP or can this start in the next 120 days? Uh, thanks for the question, David, and thanks for those uh, kind remarks uh, that you know really go across the corporation to many teams and, and groups, uh, including courts and the lease and, and many others. Uh, in terms of uh, secondary planning for expansion areas, um, you know, I, I think some are probably, you know, waiting until, you know, the minister weighs in. Um, others I know are starting to work on, on terms of reference. I would say the, um, the, uh, the work plan uh, report that I mentioned uh, that will come forward will, uh, will be critical in terms of, um, you know, um, timing and when they can proceed. Um, a lot of that work, you know, there's lead up work and studies, um, you know, that will have to happen before the you know, community design plan, secondary plan process starts. So there's no, um, you know, I know for one area already, we're already, we're already into it in terms of, uh, you know, reviewing and commenting and trying to come up with a terms of reference for the various studies that have to happen. So let's, uh, I guess it's really a case by case uh, basis. And then the, uh, we did receive a couple uh, directions in terms of priorities uh, from council through the official plan. So those, uh, of course, will have, uh, you know, uh, a higher priority uh, for the reasons, you know, that, that council directed. But that uh, that work plan report uh, will be, I, I think, critical in terms of, uh, you know, for, you know, you know, there, there, but there's a lot of work that can happen, you know, um, on, on the private side, um, uh, you know, in advance of that uh, secondary planning process as well. So I would, I would reach out and uh, we can, we can have. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I, 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 I thought that's probably was going to be your response, um, which then I want to lead into my suggestion and, and Councillor Moffat, I, um, if I, if I can ask you, I don't know what the right protocol is because we're an advisory board. So we're supposed to be advising, I believe, uh, council on suggestions or, or, or anything along planning matters. And, and one element that really caught my, uh, my ear through the, through the uh, council de deliberations was that the 2022 work plan was most likely going to be deferred until after the next municipal election, which is, as we know, is 11 months from now. Um, so just a suggestion, is there, any, is there any way that some of the more critical work plan items, uh, specifically around affordable housing or housing affordability, uh, which I think majority of the residents of the city of Ottawa, Ottawa are behind to fix, is there any way that there could be a portion of the 2022 work plan that could go ahead in early 2022 and not be Kicked, kicked past uh, the next municipal election. Again, it's just a suggestion. I like. I'm not. I'm not here to pretend I'm a politician. I'm just. I'm just here to to just hopefully use some common sense that we really need housing. We need housing. If we don't have housing, prices will continue to increase. And that gap between a first time home buyer and people that need subsidized housing is only going to get bigger. So we're all in this together. We we have to find a way to provide supply to help the affordability crisis we're all in. Yeah, I can take that conversation away and, and talk to Don and, and Steve Willis, and obviously I've got the other chair of planning here today, uh, Glenn Gower as well. And we can have that discussion. I mean, it's not like our planning group is, is planning on doing uh, nothing in 2022. Um, it's not necessarily the election that's the issue. It's, it's there's a lot on that work plan uh, from, from what we just, finished up with the official plan and obviously we've been very sort of adamant about official plan implementation and that process starting as soon as possible uh, so there's a lot on their on their plate right now and i don't think it's a matter of pushing things off because of the election it's just that there's other things on on going on so i'm happy to talk to, to don and steve and and see more about exactly what the plan is and go forward from there but like i said we will be talking about work plan at the next advisory committee thank you Thank you, uh, Mohammed. 
Thank you, Scott. And thank you to everyone at the city who uh, for your presentations. Uh, very, uh, you know, really exciting, and we're all very. I'm very proud to see all the excellent work and all the initiatives that have been uh, kind of coming underway. Thank you for meeting with us at such a late hour as well. Um, in addition to all your busy schedules. Um, with that said, I will echo uh, what Carolyn mentioned earlier about the kind of um, importance actually of receiving presentations ahead of time. And I would say, you know, a week is, is good, two weeks is better. A lot of us here are, I mean, this is a societal cross section. There's people who are in the business. I'm here representing the OEA. I know Carolyn's involved with community groups who so has a background as well and so can we can kind of jump into these topics really quickly. There are others potentially on the board as well on, on this uh, committee who might take this presentations and discuss them with others and really kind of solicit feedback and, and input. And that, that would include myself. I would like to have the opportunity to take this and discuss it with my colleagues as well and get their feedback um, that so that I'm not just talking about my own personal opinions that I'm kind of here to represent a larger community. Um, so I would say for sure, be great to, you know, we all need deadlines and just give ourselves a deadline of two weeks before um, any PAC meeting that the presentation should be prepared and distributed uh, to get the most out of our time and, and your time as well. But thank you very much for, for, for that. Um, I will start with uh, just a question to Richard. Well, it's actually, let's say I'll put it out there in general. We're in the midst of, uh, you know, the Glasgow Climate Summit. Well, I haven't heard anything in any of the presentations that talks to the climate crisis. So really, and uh, that's not to say that there's nothing happening, but we all know that uh, planning, um, you know, cities, uh, the, the planning of cities, housing, code related issues, infrastructure that has, you know, I think, well, I know my industry is the third largest polluter um as far as carbon uh, goes so it's a fairly it's you know the two go hand in hand how we plan our cities and how we plan for um how we regulate our buildings and how we regulate growth plays a really major role in how we're going to be able to tackle this climate crisis and i find it a bit strange that with this said they really haven't heard about how a lot of the city initiatives are directly addressing uh climate again there are peripheral um Kind of relationships, and I'm sure there are, there are projects that you haven't mentioned, which 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 are you know aiming to to tackle those. But I would say that you know myself, I would be very interested to really hear about what, how the city is is is, is uh, tackling this crisis firsthand. Uh, with respects to code, for example, Richard, I know that um, some municipalities. I know Vancouver has recently said that starting in 2022, there is going to be a moratorium on uh, uh, fossil fuel fired appliances for all new builds and renovations. So that's, you know, again, they're leveraging their clean energy grid. Um, they're making sure that whatever growth happens in the future is going to make use of a, a carbon free or a carbon, you know, a highly carbon positive kind of uh, power grid. Uh, I know Toronto are also considering similar in some areas are considering some what's Ottawa doing with respects to building codes and kind of trying to, you know, in between the NBC and, and, and uh, at the municipal level, how are we really pushing this what really seems like a tremendous, um, you know, a tremendous opportunity for growth. We're hearing about all these, you know, uh, massive increases in applications. How are we leveraging that to make sure that actually we, you know, we're, 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 we're ending up in the right place and we're not just piling up on these developments and these homes and houses and high rises that are just piling up more carbon and making things worse for us? Well, thanks, Maud, for the question. And I can, I can speak, you know, a little bit about that, but I think I'll defer a lot of it to Don. Is it, is it your group that's sort of, yeah. So we're, uh, as you know, I guess we're, we don't advocate in the sense that's not our role, it's not our mandate. I mean, we take our direction um, from the building code uh, and the building code is uh, up for comment right now. It's been circulated for the next uh, round of uh, 
uh, comments. And, uh, you know, we have a team working on that right now. So I'm not, I can't speak to exactly where, what is potentially coming through from a provincial level. Um, and, uh, but if, if the past is any prediction, uh, that's been, I guess, the number one item that has uh, dominated any sort of code um, updates over the last few years is, is uh, continual energy efficiency. Um, and I think you're speaking a little you know, more broadly than that. Um, but I will turn it over to Don because uh, there, is a, there is a group that we are, we are feeding into, but the, the push is coming uh, from, from Don's group. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard. I'm just going to turn my camera off because I think my connection is still uh, a little unstable. So hopefully this works better than the last uh, response. Um, yeah, and, and that's for uh, Mohammed. We actually, uh, you know, last night had a presentation at our uh, Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee and, and, you know, climate change and energy evolution was a big topic of discussion. So um, you know, I suppose it, it does cr across uh, every committee now, and uh, um, but you know certainly it's uh, there's a lot going on. Building on on Richard's comments, um, yeah, there's uh, there's there's a lot of things underway. We're developing uh, high performance development standards for for new construction to ensure you know that our new builds are uh, energy efficient and re you know reducing um, you know. Uh, emissions such, such that we will achieve our, our targets uh, in time. We have a, a Building Better uh, Homes loan pro program that's, uh, that's dealing with uh, retrofits of existing homes, making them more energy efficient. Uh, it's recently been released. We're also looking at a commercial building program, uh, pursuing funding opportunities uh, for those and other initiatives. I could go on you know, uh, green bus, uh, uh, electric bus acquisitions, uh, and so on. And um, I think that would, you know, that would be a, a couple more hours of discussion, but, um, you know, happy to point you in terms of uh, uh, what's going on there. There's, there's sure. been some reports and, uh, yeah. Well, that'd be great. I mean, I, I think it's really more when I heard about what, you know, the plans for Vancouver, and obviously it's not going to be without a backlash that, you know, just to say that there there are no more fossil fuel appliances, period, and that's it. And it's just kind of foot down crisis, and let's kind of find kind of ways to deal with it. Um, and again, whether or not that's that's something that Ottawa's considering, but it it you know it's it'd be great to kind of make sure that this remains on agendas and topics and discussions because it's I think something that everyone is really where we're all looking to our leaders to kind of see how how that uh, how that translates and it's again like you said it's something that crosses every path it's not just kind of um, zoning or or kind of bylaw or or public space it and planning I mean even you know with respect to David's comments about affordability you know can we afford to expand um, or should we be looking at actually you know, consuming less land and densifying in areas. And, but again, the question of affordability remains up there and remains something that is very important and needs to be addressed, but it doesn't have to be at the cost of expansion and more cars and more, more, you know, more carbon in the air to get to where you need to, because affordability can be translated into going further and further out of the city to be able to afford something. Um, so it's, I think it's an important topic and I think it would be great if we kind of maybe even at every planning session should be uh, able to kind of hear some of the initiatives that are being taken um, and, and things that the city are, you know, moves that the city are making in order to address this, uh, this climate crisis. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna kind of uh, move on to something else. Again, back to Richard as far as codes are concerned. So, you know, there's, um, with this increase in applications, I'm assuming that your, your teams are stretched. You're really kind of working, you know, in addition to the challenges by, uh, you know, face on you with remote work and, and COVID and whatnot, um, you have all these, you know, a, a, a giant increase in applications. How is the, how is the follow-up and the post application process in terms of uh, site reviews or kind of follow-up on, um, you know, if there's any special uh, amendments or special kind of arrangements that are being made to obtain permits or to obtain zoning uh, uh, amendments, how is your department able to cope with that influx as well? 
So uh, thanks. Uh, oh, go ahead, Lily. I want to share it's a question for development applications or building permits. Uh, Richard, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, yeah, no, uh, for sure. This uh, you know, COVID has as as given us all a challenge. Uh, no doubt, you hit it on the head with uh, the, your comments, and uh, you know, we're all. I think we're all taking in um, lessons learned from this, and uh, we have an ongoing uh, structural review going on presently. Uh, and you know, there'll there'll be hybrid models. There'll be different things that we're we're looking at. Uh, but we're, we're, we're still basically in it. Um, and uh, we're just trying to, uh, we are a little bit more reactionary right now. We're, we're trying to meet the demand the best way we can. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't really have anything new to add exactly that there's anything ongoing, but other than, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, take lessons learned out of this and see where it takes us. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Court, and when it um, just with relation to the uh, design guidelines, you mentioned that there's uh, low-rise design guidelines that are being developed, as well as design guidelines for uh, publicly operated uh, private spaces. How how are these guidelines developed? Maybe you can kind of shed some light on in terms of the process. Is this, uh, you know, is there consultation um, with community groups? Is there consultation with professional associations? And how do you kind of make sure that you're getting kind of a fairly balanced approach between kind of procedures and operations that the city needs to kind of maintain, but also be able to remain open and transparent to kind of a wider um, you know, wider input from the uh, from the from the community and from professionals uh, in the community. Thanks for the question. It's a it's a really good one. Um, you know, initially we we had seen them as technical documents. I'm talking about ten years ago. They were brought forward as as technical documents that were generated by the department. But we've seen the interest uh, from the community, from our stakeholders. Uh, to, to have more input and more influence on these guidelines. So what we do is we have a project manager on, on my team. Typically, it's an architect or a landscape architect who does an internal uh, draft development of the guidelines in consultation with, with Lily and her staff, development review and Dawn and obviously policy. And then we typically then fan out uh, to both uh, residents and to specific stakeholders. OAA is, is one certainly that we'd, wanna, we'd want to uh, liaise with. Um, high-rise design guidelines we did two years ago. We did a good degree of stakeholder engagement then. You probably recall uh, low-rise we're about to go out in January on uh, Mohammed. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll be we'll be knocking on on various uh, folks' doors, um, and we're as well as pops as I mentioned earlier. Next up is mid-rise uh, design guidelines. We anticipate starting those at the end of 2022 as well. Um, we've got about 15 uh, design guidelines. Don's given us lots of work to do. Um, there's there's a lot of tune-up to be done. Some of them are five, 10 years old. Um, so we will be working on those over the next uh, two, three years. But low-rise, pops, and mid-rise are the highest priority right now. So it is just to kind of will span from, uh, it will kind of, you know, you'll be able to reach out to community groups and be able to kind of solicit feedback and input into kind of developing those guidelines. It's it's not going to remain at the professional or city level. Absolutely. As I said, 10 years ago, it was, it was more of a professional technical document, but mm -hmm. we're not in that game anymore. And certainly there's a lot of interest uh, from the community we saw during the official plan about low rise typology and context and neighborhood identity. And we'll be absolutely doing a robust uh, public engagement uh, process for the uh, for the upcoming guidelines. It's great to hear also that uh, the city is kind of really considering, I think we've all seen the success of the kind of streetscapes and the patios and the closure, street closures. I think uh, everyone would agree that it's a very positive, whether you're a business owner or a resident. This is kind of all, I would imagine, kind of, well, unless you're a resident, unless you're a business owner that depends on car traffic, um, everyone else would really kind of appreciate uh, the type of closures and the type of activities that you've been doing. So it's great to hear that your group is really looking at the successes, or let's say that everyone should be looking at the, you know, what COVID has brought in terms of positives 
uh, in terms of kind of shaking up the way we work and the way we imagine and uh, trying to kind of stick to some of those things moving forward. So that's kind of really positive to hear that that is an official uh, project that you're kind of undertaking. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I am kind of just going through some of my notes here. Yeah, I think that's it actually. The, my last comment, and I'm not sure, I think it might fall in your department as well, Corey, was a uh, court, sorry, was the, um, the kind of overall, I think we've also with COVID, we've seen a tremendous kind of increase in the public's kind of desire to be outside, to be outdoors, to be in nature. And, and again, back to, you know, the importance of pops and in the city, but also extending beyond that and trying to kind of really expand the kind of overall health and well-being of, of communities through uh, providing kind of means, um, I guess, sustainable means to allow everyone to kind of engage with their kind of environment. Is that, is the, you know, moving beyond the urban, an immediate urban setting and moving maybe into areas that are maybe more naturalized or more kind of um, you know, less urban. Is that, is that something, an area that falls under your uh, department as well, looking at you know, parks in general, kind of city parks in general that fall outside an urban zone? Uh, good question. It, it, it certainly crosses all three of us uh, on, or four of us really on the call tonight. I think, you know, council has been very clear on its priorities. We didn't really get into the city strategic plan tonight, but housing affordability, climate change adaptation, social equity, trees, uh, all, all been raised by various folks tonight. Those have all been top of mind and, and are influential in all the policy development operations we do. I alluded to the, to the parks and rec master plan that was brought forth with the OP uh, last month. It certainly set uh, priorities for, for my group and I don't want to speak for Lily, but I, I certainly think for, for development review as well, uh, for where we, we are looking to achieve um, more uh, more recreational space, whether it's passive or programs in, in all areas of Ottawa. My team uh, sits outside the development review process and we look to um, do proactive um, um, interventions where there is a companion development application. So we're, we've been fairly focused on the urban area uh, where they're in on streets or in areas uh, where there hasn't been a development application, but certainly we work with Lily uh, and her staff on, uh, on identifying any spaces, more and more pops as, as we can uh, where available. Lily, I don't know whether you wanna layer on anything further on top of that, that'd be helpful for the, for the committee. Thank you, Kurt, and uh, thanks to Mohammed for the question. So, um, the, the the work on the development applications and, and any other works involve a lot of people, a uh, lot of other teams beyond uh, you know for us here. And as I mentioned earlier, one uh, big player is the uh, parks and recreation. Uh, uh, we call them parks planning. So they are actually heavily involved and worked closely with our teams in terms of providing the uh, recreational spaces. Um, but this is uh, related to the development and they have their own plans uh, in terms of providing city parks that are all side of development applications. The uh, court just mentioned the uh, park recreational master plan was recently approved by council. Uh, to my knowledge, the parks uh, parkland education bylaw is also being uh, will be updated next year and will be worked on as a, the requirement under the planning act. Um, so that is something you will be interested to learn as well. Is that something that has increased in funding as well as that benefited from any of the kind of stimulus that has been injected for, um, you know, the COVID stimulus that you mentioned, Cord? Like, is that the Parks and Recreations? Yeah. Well, has that infrastructure evolved with the to increase in demand? I guess that's what I'm trying to say, because it, it, you know, it, we've heard a lot about kind of, say, on the planning side of things and the structured growth, but um, when it just comes to, as far as the, um, increased traffic and the kind of increased need for these types of spaces or demand for these kind of spaces as there have been an increase in the budgets um, to see these environments grow? That's a good question. Um, you know, the, the funding is really based on funding availability and the different priorities. Uh, the, the parks master plan would provide some directions on how to prioritize those requirements and the demands. Thank you. 
That's all for me. All right, thanks. And just to your first question, I, I sent a uh, another email with the Better Buildings Ottawa strategy, which kind of speaks to what you were talking about at the start in terms of um, more you know environmental policy built embedded into some of our planning uh, framework. So that's that comes through our climate resiliency group, which is under planning, uh, but it actually came through the environment committee. Um, so I didn't know if I should share that with you all uh, via email just a few minutes ago. Uh, Carolyn. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, just uh, picking up a, a bit on Mohammed's uh, questions or comments about the uh, guidelines, low rise and uh, guidelines. I was going to ask about the mid rise guidelines. So, Court, I'm really happy to hear that they're they're in the they're in the hopper. Or they will be getting in the hopper for 2022. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I think it just you know looking ahead with the official plan, the emphasis on corridor uh, development um, intensification. That's we're really going to need those and. We're really, and to Mohammed's points as well, I think about making sure that um, we have a really, uh, the, the public uh, engagement and by public, I, I mean residents, I mean industry, I mean, you know, stakeholders broadly um, are able to weigh in and really and really um, inform those guidelines, I think will be, will be really important. Um, and I guess just to, a, a couple of things, I guess, um, I guess, first of all, and, and we saw it a bit with the official plan as well, there were uh, questions about um, about the sort of as we heard it um, feedback uh, from the city uh, regarding comments received about the official plan and those comments I believe were were um, largely or uh, those of residents uh, community associations but but not so much of, of industry or at least I didn't see um, what I what I would have thought to have been industry comments reflected in those. So I would really encourage the city, and maybe this is a this is a comment to go to back to Charmaine Forgy um, about about public engagement uh, on this. And it's not just a it's not just a higher a mid rise guideline uh, issue. It's it's um, it's anything where where I think the the issues that are being wrestled with um, are going to depend on input from industry, architects, developers, and so on, as well as community and residents. Um, so I'd really encourage the city to take that seriously because, and the reason I say that is because I really think it's important for residents to understand what the, um, to, to be able to think about, to understand what the pressure points and the concerns are of industry so that we can, we can understand the trade-offs um, that really we must be made when we're developing, whether it's zoning or guidelines or, or what have you. I, I, I really think that's important. Um, to, to be able to really truly wrestle with the with the issues and, and where we land on those on those guidelines. So um, so I, I would just that's a bit of a plea or request to, uh, on that basis, both in terms of the process. Yes, to Mohammed's point, involve the stakeholders um, uh, liberally and then get the feedback and make sure that people are seeing the whole picture, not just their personal viewpoint that they come in with can be sometimes a narrow narrow viewpoint. Um, so that's one thing. And I guess the other thing is sort of a question and a comment. Um, and and uh, the guidelines, I, I think many people look at the city's guidelines and think they're, uh, many of them are terrific, whether it's traditional Main Street guidelines or or the high-rise guidelines and and so on. Um, my concern is, is just that um, they are guidelines. And I, as I've been told, well, as we all know, they're not the official plan. And as I was told, they are nice to have. They're simply nice to have. Um, and I guess my, and I guess a bit of a question of how, how do we reconcile, I guess, the city's um, uh, wanting to pursue high quality urban design? Um, and, and I think the guidelines speak to that intent. Um, but then at the end of the day, with a specific planning application, uh, that those are very, well, in my own view, fairly easily pushed aside. Um, uh, and, and we're told that those are those are nice to have. So I think there's a, both a communications and expectations setting uh, challenge there for, uh, you know, for people who are looking at a specific application and looking to those guidelines to to inform. Um, and uh, anyway, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that, but uh, but uh, but I would say I think that's it's something that uh, that I, I don't know what the answer is or how we get at that to to try and strengthen the, the standing of those guidelines um, and and at the same time manage people's expectations uh, of those. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. And just finally, last question. Maybe I was having a senior's moment when Don was answering my earlier questions about uh, about the big moves report and the other the, the approach papers and the comparative view. When when do we expect to see like public consultation? Is that a Q3 uh, event? That's great. That's all for me tonight. Thank you very much. Don, were you going to answer the question about the, the timing for the consultation that Carolyn just asked about? Uh, yeah, I think I said, uh, and, and maybe you didn't catch uh, catch me uh, my earlier response, but I will get back to you on more specifics oh. on on the timing and consultation on both those pieces, Carolyn. So happy to do so. That's great. Thanks very much, Don. Appreciate it. Thanks, Don. Uh, Shannon. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to expand on Mohammed's comments. I think that, in, you know, within the context of designing our cities for climate change, we can also be looking at mitigating uh, the kind of urban heat island effect with greater integration of like rewilding or biodiversity into the cores. And I've, you know, talked about performative green infrastructures. But I was also thinking if we are developing new housing typologies for infill in the city cores, that that could also be combined with integration of kind of performative green systems or energy systems. And in fact, maybe that could also be linked or layered with performative performance-based building code. Um, and then um, the other thing is, I think even at a kind of regional scale, um, all the new light rail transit lines, I think the Portland has a best case practice where they've also integrated obviously recreational systems along the light uh the light rail right of way but also animal habitat and corridors so i think that those are interesting case studies and maybe just at a kind of larger um i mean in response to carolyn's comment and i've mentioned this at numerous number of meetings in response to the official plan that uh you know tune dreesen the former president of the oaa the ontario association of architects has been really working on developing a national architecture policy, um, as have other colleagues, um, you know, looking at maybe reform to the current procurement process at the government level anyways, where the lowest bid is taken. And I know, you know, having visited Waterfront Toronto a few weeks ago, which is a both a, a city, federal and provincial agency, that they are not there, they, they do look for the kind of top design project. So uh, again, I'm wondering if, if there's ways to to leverage um, uh, it, again fun, funding for innovative infrastructure, green infrastructure, again, Infrastructure Canada is targeted, I think, billions towards this, but also again thinking about maybe introducing like Quebec, the design competition, architectural design competition, fostering design excellence and best case practices because we are the capital as well. A lot of good comments there. I'll just add from from the urban design perspective that uh, that you'll you've seen in the new official plan a strong emphasis on a design culture and on design competitions, and you're going to see for the first time in in my career a few design competitions popping up uh, for some pretty high profile developments on the private side in Ottawa in the next two years, uh, which I find really exciting personally. Um, we're we're pushing that agenda. As, as much as we can on the on the development side, Lynn, uh, Lily and myself, and on the public side as well, the, both the Byard Market Public Ground Plan, the Spark Street Public Ground Plan, they really speak to the importance of of design competitions through uh, through public procurement processes as well. So, I'm uh, I'm very much in alignment with what you're saying, Shannon. Thanks. Will Will there be a call for those, or do you have a timeline on those the calls for those competitions, or it's they're kind of in the works right now. Certainly on the public projects, uh, as as we have funding to implement the projects, absolutely. Uh, the Rio Sussex node project that I spoke about earlier, where we're doing the traffic study, the intention there is to undertake a, a design competition for the, the, the place that's created on those lands. Um, that's hoping to be 2023. On the private projects, uh, you'll see those design competitions next year. Um, I can't say which projects, obviously, right now to, due to confidentiality, but Lily and I are in conversations on, on those uh, right now with proponents. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I keep hearing that that that, that 
Better Buildings Ottawa Strategy, I think, has a lot of answers to some of these questions that that you're then the things you're looking for for the city to be doing. Um, obviously, we have to work with our partners in the federal government, provincial government, to advocate for some of this stuff, and that's what the strategy uh, does. I wonder if it wouldn't hurt to maybe at the next meeting to actually have someone here from our our climate resiliency group to um, talk about what they're doing uh, with the climate resiliency strategy, with some of the things that they're working on within the planning group. Uh, I might make that invite for them to come out and do a bit of presentation for the group just because a lot of the stuff ties back, especially with some of what Mohammed's saying, Shannon, what you're saying uh, ties back to that, our, our resilience group. And I think it, it wouldn't hurt uh, for them to come out to this committee and, and have a chat about that. Uh, and Claude. Thank you. Um, I, I agree that the the building better, smarter suburbs seems to be doing some initi some interesting initiatives. Um, it is suburban, though. It would be interesting to to see that expanded to the urban realm for sure. Well, it's a, and, that's a different. So I, I, we we probably have this bad habit of naming things too similar to one another. But it's the <laughs> better buildings uh, Ottawa strategy. So the building better, smarter suburbs is a, something completely different. Yeah, okay. Um, I just wanted to add to some of the other discussion uh, in terms of uh, the improved maintenance quality standards. I know from my own experience that even uh, parks have had pretty dismal um, maintenance budgets. Uh, and that basically affects the design. So the designs get really watered down to, to super simple elements and, and things like habitat creation, naturalized areas. Um, become uh, really kind of lip service and they don't they don't get integrated and they don't function. Um, so I think there could be opportunities for, for collaboration there possibly with industry um, and tying into that, uh, I know that the something Shannon was speaking to the green infrastructure, some of the the bioswales that were done, the urban bioswales, I believe they're over 10 years old. I had looked for some data on them uh, to see if there were best practices developed and, and what was happening, but I couldn't find, there seems to be no data. So I just wanted to point to the importance of, of monitoring because um, a lot of these are really super initiatives, but unless we're measuring them uh, and seeing that they're effective, uh, we're kind of just shooting in the dark, I think. Uh, that speaks to street trees as well. I know historically, there is a lot of my dog is having a fit beside me over here. Um, historically, uh, street trees, uh, suburban street trees, urban street trees, um, massive issues with uh, with uh, conflicts, utility conflicts, the fear of roots undermining foundations, and having these really restrictive policies in place. Um, we need to get more creative um, because we need to we need to understand that the for instance, the urban forest is more important than um, potentially these small local issues. So we, you know, again, monitoring, look at it. Um, so again, creativity, flexibility, that ties into budgets as well. Budgets are limited. Uh, so perhaps there's more opportunities for, again, with POPs, but even going into other urban spaces, maybe even going into suburban spaces, uh, maybe uh, green space uh, budgeting is, is shared in a different way. I know there's a, a park budget for development, um, depending on the size of the park. Uh, if it's a district park or community park, the, the land budget ratio, because it's a per hectare basis, um, it becomes generous enough that you can implement some interesting things. But then as these spaces become smaller, that budget, it gets you nothing. It gets you turf grass on a, a plot of land. Um, so there needs to be, uh, I think that really needs to be rethought. That's my, that's my blurb. All right. Uh, thank you for that. I'm not seeing any further questions at this, uh, this time. Hope everyone got a chance to, uh, anything they wanted to say or ask got, uh, got out there. So. Um, I will then go back to the agenda. So that's the only item. So it's that planning committee, planning advisory committee. Let's uh, get confused, <laughs> share so many committees. Um, the planning advisory committee receive this presentation for information. Is the item received? It is received. Uh, thank you 
all very much. I, there's no notice of motion inquires out of business or anything. So um, again, appreciate, uh, appreciate you're all uh, attending here today. I mean, I think if you, any of you, I know Carolyn was, was paying attention to our, our three days of official plan uh, meetings that we held a few weeks ago. And um, I had mentioned, I think I commented on this advisory committee a few times. Um, I think, I think it's, it's well worth the people to attend and actually pay attention to what the conversations that we have here, because it's really the only place where you have a, a cross section of uh, members of council. Of course, last time we had uh, Council Tierney and Councilor Leeper here, of course, Councilor Gowers here, uh, members of the community, the development industry, um, and then also city staff all kind of in one spot having a conversation. I think it's, it's quite beneficial uh, to the city and to for the, the greater public and the fact that we'll put these up, because I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, questions uh, sorry, desire to see the last conversation put up, which Kelly has said that she'll try to do that. So I think it's beneficial to have uh, these conversations and put them out for, um, for sorry, someone just sent me a message, um, for better consumption. Uh, Mohammed, you wanted to say something? Scott, thank you. I just want to second what you just said. I think all of us here, we, we hear, we, we get, you know, a lot of great initiatives and very short kind of really kind of synopsis of, of, of these efforts that are ongoing, very exciting. But a lot of us, I know myself, I would really appreciate just being in the loop, you know? So if, if there's something happening, I'll get an email. I might be able to attend, uh, I might not be, but somehow if there's, a, if there's an effort somehow to kind of keep the members of this committee um, linked to what's being presented to us, I, that would be fantastic. I think a lot of us would, really appreciate to see uh, or you know see the depths that this uh, that you know the, the city is going into and not really rely on a very high level uh, kind of understanding of, of what's 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 you know all the efforts all the great efforts that that, uh, that everyone's working on yeah and i think too like i mean what i did tonight with forwarding you some stuff that's relevant to our conversations i could always do that too i mean i don't have to wait for a meeting to do that kind of stuff like when we have certain things that come up that i think might be um, you know, good for future discussion or just to provide information that can be built into a future discussion when we actually have our meeting, our meetings. Um, I can do that as well, because we have a lot of stuff going on at the city. I mean, there's been, I think we've had like, like 1600 master plans approved in the last three months. So at least it feels like that. And um, I think it's, it'd, it'd be worthwhile to pass some of that stuff on. And, and Kelly and I have spoken during this meeting too about uh, ensuring, I know I've been saying it uh, every meeting, but ensuring that we do get stuff out to you guys. Um, sooner than you know day of or even a couple of days before ideally i'd love the stuff to be ready for you when we're sending you the the agenda package that's what i'd prefer um so okay uh that is it our next meeting is wednesday february 2nd 2022 so on adjournment good stuff thank you all enjoy the rest of your evening Have a great thank day. you thank you very much thanks very much